next person that we have coming up is Dr. Patrick Hackett. He works as a chiropractor locally in Stevensville, and his wife also works there with him. And uh, he's a longtime resident of this area, uh, and they have a four-year-old son. And so he is here to talk with us about some of the chiropractor <laughs> issues that can help with pain as well. Welcome, Dr. Hackett. Good morning. There we go. So like they said, I'm a chiropractor in Stevensville, Michigan, here locally, uh, with my wife, who is actually also a chiropractor as well. Today I want to talk about basically where I think chiropractic fits in the whole paradigm of trying to help people with pain, usually before they get on medication, but also if they're on medication at the time, what we can do to help, maybe taper them off of that medication and prevent some of these uh, tragedies that have happened um, in the area. So we'll start off basically with um, what is chiropractic in general, because a lot of people don't actually know what chiropractic is. There's a couple of misconceptions out there as well. Plus, chiropractic has changed in the last 10 to 15 years, especially, um, with the training that's involved and what we actually can do for people. And also what we don't do anymore, which I'll kind of go over as well. Then I'll kind of give my opinion on where chiropractic fits in the overall picture. I have some research kind of thrown in the mix, but I also always ask from Mindy to throw in some of my own personal experience. <clears throat> so it's not just all dry, you know, boring research. And also so it's not seven hours long. <laughs> and I'm also gonna stick today to pretty much just the adjustment itself. Chiropractic is more than just the adjustment, but the adjustment is the biggest part of what we do. So also to keep the um, talk a little bit shorter, I'm gonna focus basically on the adjustment itself and its effect on pain, which I'll go over as well. If we have time, I'm going to go over some case studies. I feel like that's a really good way of kind of solidifying and giving you some personal stories of people that we've helped, and actually a few that we haven't that I referred out. That's part of our job as well, is to find out if we are the right type of provider for them. If we are, great. We do our job and hopefully help people and get them on their way. And if not, then I refer out to other providers like orthopedic doctors, um, neurologists, physical therapy, and then, um, of course, for pain control if needed. So chiropractic in a nutshell, it's basically a healthcare profession that focuses on disorders of the musculoskeletal system and the nervous system and their effects on health in general. So most of what we deal with is back pain, neck pain, headaches, things along those lines. We also treat um, vertigo, you know, knee issues. I treat a lot of runners. So it's more than just back pain, but I would say honestly back pain is about 80% of what we see. And then, like I said, the most common therapeutic procedure we use, which I'm going to go over today, is the actual spinal adjustment itself. In some cases, we'll be the primary physician dealing with somebody's issue with uh, regards to back pain or neck pain, but there are times that we're co-managing with somebody else, um, their primary care physician, maybe another provider like a physical therapist, or even somebody um, a lot of times will be seeing a psychologist as well if they have uh, chronic pain. And that's actually why the uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America have chiropractors on staff. It's obviously not to treat the cancer itself. It's to treat the pain that goes along with the cancer or from people being bedridden. They have obviously a lot of pain as well. So we're happy to be a part of that. And that's why the Cancer Treatment Centers of America have such good rates of um, helping people because they use a multifaceted approach, which I'll kind of go over today as well. These are some basic questions that I get quite often about chiropractic, and I thought it'd be helpful to go over some of these today as well. So do we x-ray every new patient? The short answer is no. Back uh, 20, 30 years ago, that used to be the, the protocol, was x-ray every single person that comes in. Research has changed now. Um, our National Association actually just updated their guidelines this year, actually, to say that without medical necessity, it's not reasonable to x-ray every new person that comes in. They used to think a long time ago, you had to see where the bones were, which ones had to move, et cetera, et cetera. What we look at now are what's called um, functional articular lesions. That's a fancy way of saying where the area is tight, where it's stuck, where it's not moving properly, not articulating properly. And so I will x-ray patients based on medical necessity. Of course, if somebody falls, gets hurt, you know, all these kind of things is in a car wreck, of course you should x-ray that person before you start pushing and pulling on them. Um, do people have to go forever once they start? The short answer with that one again is no. What would I do when I have a new patient that comes in? I evaluate what's going on with that particular issue they have for that acute flare-up that they're experiencing. We lay out a protocol for that, which of course 
protocols are great, but it, patients will either respond faster or shorter, or you know, less quickly than the protocol itself. So of course, protocols have to be modified a little bit based on actual patient response. But my job basically is to get people out of my office with those acute flare-ups and then get them on their, on their way and living their life. Um, will we refer out to another provider? I kind of already went over this one, but yes is the short answer with that one. We are taught to work with other providers and to um, work with, once again, that multifaceted interdisciplinary approach. I like to help people where I can, but like Heidi said, I'm not a miracle worker, so there are cases that come in that I cannot help or even some cases that I can't touch in the first place. I've sent people out after talking to them for 20 minutes saying, this is not a case that I can even put my hands on you and, and help you at all with this, so you need to go see a orthopedic doctor, a neurologist, something along those lines. And then what, what is that popping sound when you get an adjustment? That's one of the biggest ones that I hear because it sounds pretty crazy sometimes. A long time ago, they thought it was bones sliding back into place or, heaven forbid, bones crunching, and I don't know how they thought that was the case because if that was the case, you shouldn't be doing any of this, <laughs> uh, obviously. So what it actually is, is it's gas bubbles that are released as you actually induce motion into the joint. It's because the joints are fluid filled and it's an enclosed space. So it's actually a side effect. It's, it's physics, it's called cavitation. You can get that popping noise about once every 20 minutes. Um, as the bubbles settle back into solution, you could get that noise again, but why would you? You've already had the adjustment itself. So at our school, we were taught to adjust with our hands and we know when that motion is induced, not adjust with our ears. Just wait and listen for it till it makes that cracking noise. Um, so where do I feel like it should fit into the overall picture? I feel like it really should be utilized as a first line of defense, as most conservative measures should be, because that's when they're most effective. It's kind of like Heidi was saying with chronic pain, there's, there's quite a link between us actually being able to help you and how long you've had an issue. Because once that neurologic um, reflex gets set in, then the muscles get tighter, then the person doesn't want to move as much, and then the muscles get even tighter, and then of course the joints get locked up, then they have I have a bad back, that becomes their thing, that almost becomes their, their psychology. And I've had plenty of those people that come in. We can help with some cases with chronic pain, but once again, those are more of an uphill battle. And there was a study that was done a while back that said that the rate of opioid use for people that got chiropractic was lower um, than non-recipients. And also you're less likely to have to fill your prescription if you see a chiropractor as well, which is pretty nice. I do. Uh, with this lower bullet, bullet point, I've had this actually happen in my practice, so I wanted to go over that as well. It's a fine line. I think there's definitely a time and a place for medications. I have had people that come in, they can barely move, their muscles are so spasmed, they're basically crying. I can't put my hands on that person to actually help them if I can't touch them. That's kind of the point of chiropractic. You have to actually put your hands on people. So I've actually referred them back to their primary care physician to see if they think it's appropriate for some sort of pain control or some sort of muscle relaxer so that those muscles can actually let go a little bit so I can then do my job and help them through this um, issue they're dealing with. But there are times where if the patient isn't educated properly or doesn't listen to what the doctor tells them, they get the pain medication, they feel great, they go out and hurt themselves worse, and then it's definitely a harder case to deal with and maybe even not able to be helped by at that point by a chiropractor. Overall, the uh, American College of Physicians, it was in 2017, they updated their guidelines to include alternative medic uh, meds, or alternative things to medication, like chiropractic, um, physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, as first lines of defense, which is really great. This is based on newer research that's been done over the years on chiropractic in the last 10 years. Um, the rate of research has just grown exponentially, which I love. And uh, they also have updated the um, FDA, the CDC, the Joint Commission, and, and 37 so far state attorney generals have updated their guidelines to include either chiropractic or spinal manipulation as a first line of defense. So it's coming around. I kind of went over this already, but basically in my clinical experience, these people that come in with chronic pain are a little bit harder to help. That is um, like what Heidi was saying. Basically in, that, in those cases, there's a lot of depression in the mix as well because people of course if you're hurting for however long you're gonna be bummed out there's no two ways about it that's where i'm not a psychologist i'm a decent listener but i'm not a psychologist so i tell people have you talked to somebody about this have you gone to some sort of support group have you um, gone for a walk even that can help a lot of times get some fresh air get some sunshine but it's out of my scope so a lot of times i try to get them to either go back to a their primary care to get referred to a psychologist or psychiatrist or B, if I have somebody that I know, I might say, okay, try this person, see if they help you. And then of course I refer out to PT. Basically what I, what I do with that is, 
I have patients come in and I send them home with little stretches or exercises for at home. I don't have rehab in office. If they're not gonna be doing those exercises or those stretches at home, and then they say they're sorry to me, and I'm like, it's not me, it's, it's your back we're dealing with, so do the stretches or don't. But I can't help you unless you do your part. So what I do with those people, I, says, I, I say maybe a PT would be appropriate in this case because you need somebody two or three times a week, whatever regimen they, they recommend, to say you're gonna come in and do these stretches with us and make sure you're doing them properly as well so that you're not hurting yourself. And that actually helps to push care forward a lot of times as well. Basically, there are people that do come to us that wanna decrease their dependence on um, pain meds, opioids, or other pain meds. And like I said before, I don't tell people to get off of medication because I'm not, it's not in my scope, number one, but I'm also not the person that prescribed it in the first place. So I would never tell somebody, oh, just take half, you know, no big deal. I always tell people, as you're feeling better, go and talk to the doctor or at least call them that recommended the medication in the first place, and then they will taper you down in an appropriate way. And a lot of times people do get off their medications after seeing us, um, which I'm happy to be a part of. This is just a cool picture I wanted to show where it was on the left-hand side before an adjustment, right-hand side after an adjustment, and that's a joint in your spine. And on the right side, yay, there's more space. So that's kind of the idea overall there. I just wanted to have at least one picture in the mix. So some more research. There was a study, um, I think it was a couple of years ago. I have all my references on the back of this, but uh, a couple of years ago, and it was 94% of manual thrust. So basically what we do, high velocity, low amplitude adjustments. Um, had pain, reduc uh, pain reduction of 30% at week four versus 56 on um, regular standard care, including drugs. So pretty good. And basically, another part of what the adjustment does, it basically, of course, gets the joint loosened up, gets the motion restored to the joint itself, lets the muscle spasm let go a little bit, which helps pain in general. But what newer research is showing is that it also helps with um, that feedback loop that Heidi was actually talking about a little bit between the back, the muscles, the joints, and the brain itself. So it actually helps your pain tolerance um, through that mechanism as well, which is actually more from the actual brain itself, which is pretty cool. A big question I get a lot as well is, are bones out of place? I kind of went over this, but the short answer is no with that. That was also, once again, 30, 40 years ago, the way it was taught and things are a little bit different nowadays. And so what they do is they actually induce the mechanical force to the joint that in turn kickstarts a whole chain of neurologic reactions besides just getting the joint moving properly. It works on all three, newer research has shown, all three parts of the um, nervous system, which is, or works on three different parts of the nervous system. So there's the central nervous system, including the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, including all the nerves that go out to the joints um, the muscles from the joints. So it works on the peripheral mechanism, which we kind of already went over today, which is the, the adjustment itself, loosening up the joints, loosening up the muscles, getting things moving the way that they should through the full or close to full range of motion, which of course is less painful for people. Then the brain-based mechanism shows that there's actually, um, Oh, sorry, so yeah, they change the connectivity between the brain regions that process pain itself. So it's not just from joint up to brain, it's actually in regions of the brain, there's actually um, changes that happen after a spinal adjustment between areas that process pain. Now that's newer research and they're not quite sure exactly what the overall effect of that will be, but it's ongoing right now. So these are just little things in addition to the adjustment that we recommend for at-home use, um, ice and heat, things like that. We also teach patients proper posture when sitting, standing, and then of course work ergonomics. I have a lot of people that work at factories, a lot of people that work construction, things like that. So I teach them how to stand, how to lift properly so they don't hurt themselves further. And then we also do utilize a little bit of like at-home TENS units, things like that. That's electrical stimulation that they can, a little battery powered pack they take home and that just helps kind of modulate pain a little bit. Um, and you know, just things in, in that regard. I do recommend at times over-the-counter use of ibuprofen. That's something that is pretty innocuous, and it, when used properly, like directed, has relatively few side effects. Um, and that does usually take the edge off of most of the types of issues that I see. With musculoskeletal pain, it's a decent adjunct. So basically, this slide is one that I really wanted to get to. It's um, Mindy, when she asked me to do this talk, asked about times that I can help and also times that I cannot help and how I know the difference and what protocol I use when I can't help. So basically, 
like I said, we have the new patient come in. It's an hour-long appointment the first time. We do, of course, intake, history. I examine them. I make sure that I can treat them in the first place. We discuss what the protocol will be. And then we usually do treatment first visit. I, what I do for treatment is pretty straightforward for most people. It's I do a little bit of heat first. That helps the muscles relax. I do a little bit of trigger point work. It's kind of like Heidi was saying. I don't do massage, but I do trigger point work, strip the muscles out, get things loosened up a little bit before we actually try to get the joint moving. Because to just lay somebody down and just go for it with the adjustment, it's a little abrupt. It's a little abrasive. And so I prefer to actually have things a little more relaxed. It also means they need less force to get the actual joints moving, which everybody's happy about, of course. And so if the person is not responding really within, I would say, two to three visits, but my outside edge is three to five visits, chiropractic's not magic. It's going to work or it's not for the issue at hand. And so usually after the first visit, there's a pretty good response. But if there's zero response after even two, three visits, then it's one of those times where it's like, okay, we tried our best, and now it's time for something else. And that's where the conservative measure first um, aspect of this is good because at least you have that baseline of what you've already tried, and then the doctor doesn't have to reinvent the wheel when they recommend something else for the patient. And that's when the pain control or anti-inflammatory shots can come in, all these other great things um, that people can do, including some of the opioids and or other pain meds. That's a time and a place for those things, for sure, and to be tapered off appropriately afterwards. And then, like I said earlier, of course, neurologic and orthopedic consult is a big part of what I deal with because most people that have issues that are coming to see me, it's going to be one of, those, one of those two if I can't help them. The case studies, I'm going to not read all the, you know, the verbiage there. If you want to read through that, some of the docs here will probably understand, or of course PTs or anybody else will understand some of the verbiage. But I'm just going to give you kind of the overall idea of what this person came in with, why, we're not a, why or why I was able to not help. Okay? The first one was referred out. This lady, her name wasn't Gloria, but that's a cool name. <laughs> and so... Basically, she was uh, an older lady that had gone to a, a chiropractor before, not myself, but she had gone to a chiropractor before. So she said, I hurt my neck, my arm is kind of sore, I, I think maybe a chiropractor could help. She called our office. And rule number one is don't diagnose over the phone. So, of course, you bring the person in to at least physically see them. Um, when she came in my office, she was in obvious pain, and she was nervous because it had been 10 years since she had been to a chiropractor, and she's also nervous about seeing a, a young doctor. Um, and I said, don't worry, you're going to be fine. And so... Uh, yeah, <laughs> but so, you know, I did the intake and she had been bowling the night before and she said she didn't feel anything, but it just was sore afterwards and it hurt her neck. And I thought, okay, it could be a lot of different things over the phone. I thought, okay, it could be nerve impingement. It could be, you pulled a muscle. It could be, you know, many, many different things. After getting her to take her coat off and starting the examination, it was obvious right away. The ball was muscled up. Uh, the muscle was balled up, pardon me and her bicep was actually fully torn. I was pretty sure. Of course, you can't tell just by looking, but that it would look like a full thickness tear. She had lost of strength. She had all sorts of other stuff going on. Not a chiropractic case. Um, you can't fix that with an adjustment. So I referred her out to orthopedic consult. They got her all fixed up. It was local. I don't know if it was Dr. Sohn or Edwards. I always get them backwards, which one does which, between arm and hip. Um, but they had her all fixed up, and she was great a few weeks out. And after doing PT, of course, afterwards. Uh, this next guy was one of the first times I was kind of freaked out by a, uh, a case that came in. I had actually treated this guy before, a few years back, and then he came in. Uh, it always seems to be the case where it's either late night or like your last one of a long week or something like that where these cases come in, and it, it tries, your, you know, uh, tries you a little bit, so you've got to stay sharp. But this one was pretty obvious, to be honest. He came in, and he had bumped his head at work and just shooting pain, terrible stuff, you know, going on over the phone. When he, when I actually came in the room, I could tell right away because he's sitting, you know, crooked, can barely move, can't even turn to see me, and just tears coming down his face. And this is not a, a weak man. That I, like I said, I treated him before for low back pain. He had five to 10 degrees of range of motion in his neck. I mean, could barely turn at all. And had shooting pain all the way down his arm, had already progressive neurologic symptoms going on. <clears throat> and... I could barely even get through any sort of examination at all. I re referred him out straight away to neurologic consult because I suspected either multiple level disc bulge or some sort of sequestration going on of the disc where a piece of it actually kind of comes through, breaks off, and causes, of course, all sorts of trouble. In the neck especially, it's, it's more overt because there's just not as much space. In the lower back with the disc bulge, there's quite a bit more you can do because just for various reasons, but a lot of it has to do with just physical space in the, in the region. 
And so in this case, he did actually get out to neurologic consult. He had to go back through the primary care first because it was a work comp case. That's the only slightly negative aspect of this story. With work comp cases, things kind of, they drag their feet a little bit. So it did take a little bit too long in my opinion, but once he got to the neuro, neuro did a great job, got him all fixed up. He did PT afterwards for uh, about six weeks, I think it was, six to eight weeks, and then had a great increase in his hand strength. He did lose a little bit from the damage that was done from hitting his head, but overall he's able to do his job still and he's doing great with that. They had him on opioids short term after the surgery and then he tapered off and he's been fine ever since, um, all things considered. This last case, I was actually able to help this guy and this is one of my favorite patients ever, to be honest. I, he's like a buddy. We hug every time he comes in now. And so when he first came in, we did not hug, though. I can tell you that much. <clears throat> he was referred out from a, a program through Veterans Choice, it's called. It's, it's a cho program where they can actually come and see a chiropractor close to where they live instead of having to go to Battle Creek or uh, Ann Arbor, I believe it is, out that way, and then up in Grand Rapids. So this gentleman came in. He, when he first came in, he was slouched over walking like this, had a walking stick and sunglasses on, hat, didn't even want to take off the sunglasses, was a grouch, you know, just didn't want to be there basically. And we see that a lot with people in pain, so I don't take it personally, of course. I mean, if I'm in pain, you don't want to be around me either. So I, so I understand. The long and short of this story is that he had had x-rays done in, um, at, through Veterans Choice. They, they do those as a default just to see what level you're at, to see if any sort of other care is appropriate. That's their protocol. And so, of course, I will look at those if, he, if a patient has those. And I saw their reports on them as well. He had quite a bit, um, all that verbiage down there about the x-ray just means that he had quite a bit of degenerative change, arthritic change, just basically terrible stuff going on. And it had it for years. Unfortunately, this, this man had dealt with um, pain for a long time. He had also dealt with some drug abuse issues. He got back from Vietnam and then got back to his life. And the factory job that he had, they fired him. And then he dealt with drug abuse for 20, 25 years. Finally got through that with some help from psychologists um, through the VA and support groups through the VA with other soldiers, which is great. And he's um, been clean ever since. So, so at least that part of his care was uh, taken care of. He did not want to use opioids because of that, because he knew that they were very addictive. And so he wanted some other option. And he just kept saying, I think I need a chiropractor. I don't know, but I, maybe it would help. And so he you know, finally got that. When he first came in, his pain level was about nine out of 10. Um, that was just every day, all the time. And obviously that would make anybody grouchy. So those are my pertinent findings, but basically the, the guy could barely move, he could barely walk, he could barely bend, he couldn't twist. I couldn't use a lot of pressure with palpation. That's the long and short of what all that's saying there. <clears throat> my initial protocol was one to two visits per week for about four weeks. And, or until the pain was cut in half, and his tr treatment would be what I already discussed as far as a little bit of heat first, muscle work, do the adjustment, and then show him some uh, just basic stretching at first to kind of keep that motion going after we got the motion induced. And so I re-examined him after eight visits, and his um, range of motion had already increased quite a bit. His pain was cut in half. He just carries his walking stick now just in case. He's standing up straighter. He's smiling a little bit. He's talking to the office staff a little bit more. Um, sunglasses came off, of course, at that point, <laughs> finally. <laughs> and uh, we're cracking jokes a little bit, you know, and stuff like that. And it's just, you know, better and better. After six months of care, which was about 14 total visits, he has basically one to two out of 10 pain. And he is just basically cartwheeling down the hallway, high-fiving the office staff. He gives them all a hard time when he comes in. He's just awesome. And uh, I love seeing this guy. I just see him every so often now. He just comes in every, oh, you know, four to six weeks, basically to stay loosened up. That's through the VA as well. They allow about 12 visits a year to, to maintain that um, once they actually are feeling good because this is the, one of the things that's helped him. I will say, though, that it wasn't just me. He's had a multifaceted approach, which is why I wanted to end with this. This is, you see the best results with people's care when you use this multifaceted approach. So he got chiropractic um, through myself. He got um, psychology and psychiatry help through the VA. He got support group help through the VA. His primary care physician helped him greatly with some kidney issues he was having through the VA, which obviously helped his pain as well because having kidney issues can um, refer pain to the back as well. So that's really where I wanted to leave it today um, with this, this man that was helped greatly through that multidisciplinary approach. And thank you for your time. Have a good rest of your day.